All right, guys, Levi Trumbull here. Dan's Restaurant and Tap House has just suffered a major defeat in terms of their federal case that Neil Glessner has against them. So here is what's going on. As I'm sure many of you are familiarized with by this point, uh, there is two lawsuits that are against Chardan LLC, uh, which is Dan's Restaurant and Tap House. There is a federal case and then there is a case in the state courts of Maryland. As you're familiarized with the facts already, Neil Glessner alleges that he was kicked out of the restaurant for being old and white. The state case is in the stages where it's moving forward. There have been new defendants that have been added to this case, and that case is currently in the works. But this is the other case in question, which is the federal case, both of which allege essentially the same set of facts, except the federal case deals with uh, issues that are handled within the federal jurisdiction. So here's what's going on. The attorneys for Dan's Restaurant and Tap House filed a motion to dismiss the federal lawsuit. And of course, uh, the plaintiff in this case, which is Glessner, had his attorney file his opposition to that. The court took a look at it and they denied the motion to dismiss meaning that the federal case has standing and will be moving forward. We are now going to bring you what was written in this memorandum opinion from the United States District Court for the District of Maryland. We are now going to get into why specifically the motion to dismiss failed and what the judge had to make of this circumstance. In the discussion, it states that in its motion to dismiss, Chardan raises three reasons why this court should dismiss Glesner's claims. First, Chardan argues that Glesner has not returned to the restaurant and therefore cannot allege a denial of services. Second, Chardan argues that Glesner has failed to allege any discriminatory intent based on race. Finally, Chardan argues that this court should abstain or at a minimum stay the case given an ongoing parallel proceeding in the Circuit Court for Washington County, Maryland. Prior to filing this instant action, Glessner filed a parallel case in the Circuit Court for Washington County, Maryland. The facts alleged in the state court complaint are nearly identical to those alleged in the present case, and the parties are similar, except the state court complaint includes a manager of Dan's Restaurant as an additional defendant. For this reason, Chardin argues that this court should abstain or at least stay the case pending the resolution of the state court case. It is well recognized, it is a well recognized rule that the pendency of an action in the state court is no bar to proceedings concerning the same matter in the federal court having jurisdiction. A federal court may abstain from exercising jurisdiction over a duplicate federal action for purposes of, quote, wise judicial administration. In deciding whether such exceptional circumstances exist, a court must first determine whether the federal and state actions are parallel. State and federal suits are parallel only, quote, if substantially the same parties litigate substantially the same issues in different forums. Even state and federal claims arising out of the same factual circumstances do not qualify as parallel if they differ in scope or involve different remedies. Here, the facts and parties are nearly identical. Allegations in the federal court complaint are taken verbatim from the state court complaint. A distinction, however, arises from the available remedies. Count one of the state court complaint alleged unlawful discrimination in a place of public accommodation under Maryland law. Similarly, count two of Glessner's federal court complaint alleges unlawful discrimination in a place of public accommodation under federal law. Although nearly identical statutes, there is no private cause of action under Maryland law. While Maryland law expressly provides the right to file a civil action for other forms of discrimination, there is no comparable provision creating a private right of action for public accommodation discrimination. For this reason, the Circuit Court for Washington County dismissed Count 1 of Glesner's state court complaint. Point B, failure to state a claim. Section 1981 grants all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States 
the same right to make and enforce contracts, a plaintiff must ultimately establish both that the defendant intended to discriminate on the basis of race and that the discrimination interfered with a contractual interest. The plaintiff must also prove that but for race, he would not have suffered the loss of a legally protected right. To state a cause of action in a 1981 action not involving employment, a plaintiff must show that one, he is a member of a racial minority, two, the defendant intended to discriminate on the basis of race, and three, the discrimination concerned one or more of the activities protected by the statute. A 1981 claim may be proven by either direct evidence or the burden-shifting approach articulated in McDonnell Douglas Corp. v. Green, U.S. 972. Chardin first challenges whether Glessner alleged intentional discrimination on the basis of race. Taken as true, Glessner's first amended complaint includes sufficient allegations of such discrimination. As alleged, a manager of Dan's restaurant stated, quote, You old white people act like you own everything. Get the F out of here. At the same time, he banned Glesner and his friend from the restaurant. Drawing all reasonable inferences in favor of the plaintiff, the manager's statement permits the interference that but for Glesner's white race, the manager would not have denied access to Dan's restaurant. Thus, Glesner has alleged a 1981 claim because he has adequately pled Chardin denied him the opportunity to contract for services at the restaurant under circumstances giving rise to an interference of unlawful race discrimination. The fact that Glessner was not present at the time the manager made the statement does not change the analysis. Next, Chardin challenges whether Glessner has been denied a contractual interest. Dining at a restaurant generally involves a contractual relationship that continues over the course of the meal and entitles the customer to benefits in addition to the meal purchased. Thus, a ban from a restaurant constitutes a sufficient interference with the ability to contract for the restaurant's services. Chardin further argues that Glessner has not suffered an interference with this contractual interest because he has not attempted to return to Dan's restaurant since the incident. No such proof is required. In Glessner's first amended complaint, he asserts that plaintiff visited Dan's for dinner, as plaintiff has done many times before, and, but for the actions of the defendant described in the complaint, would have done many times since. He later attempts to contact restaurant management to ask them to, quote, reverse the decision so that he could resume patronizing the establishment in peace. Such efforts reflects attempts to resume business with the restaurant. Further, there is ample evidence that Glessner is, in fact, banned from the restaurant. Facebook posts made by a manager of the restaurant noting that Glessner, quote, was recently asked not to return to Dan's because he has mistreated our staff and shown blatant disrespect for our rules and hours of operation. The ban itself is a denial of the restaurant's services. Here, the manager's direct statement regarding Glessner's white race in conjunction with his directive to refuse service to Glessner in the future is sufficient on its own to state a plausible claim. For all of these reasons, Glessner alleges a plausible claim under 1981. It goes on to say Chardin makes the same challenge that Glessner has failed to allege intentional discrimination or the denial of restaurant services. As discussed, taken in the light most favorable for Glessner, the manager's statement provides the connective thread between his race-based remarks and his decision to ban Glessner from the premises. Further, allegations that the manager has banned Glessner from returning to the restaurant is sufficient to show the denial of the privileges of a restaurant. Glessner has alleged facts demonstrating his attempt to connect with the restaurant and lift his band so that he may return. This is sufficient to demonstrate an attempt to exercise the benefits 
and enjoyment of a restaurant, Glessner need not have physically returned after having been instructed not to return in order to bring a claim. Thus, for the same reasons discussed above, Glessner alleges a plausible claim. For the reasons stated above, defendant's motion to dismiss is denied. A resounding defeat as it relates to the attempt for Dan's Restaurant and Tap House to dismiss the lawsuit brought by Neil Glessner. It will move forward, and this is certainly good news for the Glessner camp. This case is not over yet. There is still more to come, but for now, the case will move forward, and I wanted to bring you the update. We will keep following it, and thank you for watching this video.